want to welcome you to this important event this afternoon. We're glad that you could join us. My first task is to ask you to turn off your cell phones since they interfere with the sound system as well as being distracting. My name is David Smock. I'm vice president in charge of the Center for Mediation and Conflict Resolution, and the author and I are colleagues in that center. I want to officially declare on my own authority that this is Stephanie Schwartz Day at the U.S. <laughs> Institute of Peace. This is a first book we have published on youth. It's written by Stephanie, who was only barely out of college when she finished work on this book. She's the youngest author we've ever published. The time the book was Finished, she was a program assistant, the first time we've ever published a book by a program assistant. She's since been promoted. <laughs> but more important than anything else, it's an excellent book on an important topic. In addition to being to her work in the Center for Mediation and Conflict Resolution, Stephanie also heads up our task force on youth and has given remarkable leadership in that capacity. So again, let me welcome you, and uh, I will turn it over to Kathleen Kunas who will moderate today's event. Thank you, David. And I can only concur, this is Stephanie Schwartz Day at the United States Institute of Peace. We're very pleased to welcome you all here. For those of you who are new to our events, may it suffice that the United States Institute of Peace is an independent, nonpartisan national institution established 25 years ago and is funded by Congress. The goals of USIP include assisting the international community in preventing, managing, and resolving conflicts. Today's event is notable for many reasons, as David has already listed several of them. The book Youth in Post-Conflict Reconstruction represents really a significant leap forward in understanding and problematizing youth in the field of conflict and peace building. Youth as an age cohort is one of the least understood in the social sciences and is underestimated uh, force in terms of economic impact. Much of the research to date has been done by the military. However, the panelists here today represent the cutting edge of understanding this age cohort, not only in conflict, but also in post-conflict environments. The book acknowledges and documents how youth are powerful change agents for war or for peace. Schwartz outlines a policy agenda for positive peace as she argues that rights-based and advocacy approaches are simply not enough to help young people navigate through post-conflict environments. She suggests instead that in addition to structural changes, youth empowerment programs provide skills and community to youth that may otherwise uh, have less opportunities. With these few framing remarks, and before I introduce the panel this afternoon, I want to emphasize that one of the important aspects of this type of an event is to engage in public discussion. I've asked each of the discussants to limit their remarks so that there's plenty of time for your comments and Q&A at the end of these uh, presentations. Our discussion today will begin with Stephanie Schwartz, author of the book, Stephanie, as we've already noted, is uh, very much a part of the Institute of Peace, a senior program assistant in the Center for Mediation and Conflict Resolution. I'm just going to kind of lay out how we're going to organize the discussion. We're going to look around, <clears throat> uh, look at the discussion around three main messages of the book. One, youth as agents of change. Youth are not simply a force of instability, but they're also agents of peace. And Shaban McEvoy Levy, who is an associate professor of political science and director of the Peace Studies Program at Butler, 
will uh, be a part of this discussion, as well as Wissam Samat, who is studying biochemistry at the Lebanese University and is currently a fellowship at UNFPA headquarters. I'm going to let that part of the panel flow together, and then I'll introduce our last two discussants at that point. Stephanie, I want to welcome you to the podium, and I think we could all give her a really warm hand. Thanks, Kathleen, for that great introduction, um, and thanks for all the panelists for being here today and everyone here who's come out to hear about um, kids these days. Uh, I also want to thank um, David Smock, um, who really opened the door for me for this project and without whom this book would not have come to fruition, so thank you. Um, uh, I thought I'd start with just sort of how I came to write about this book, how I came to be interested in these issues. I was actually um, studying in an intro to modern civil wars class at Wesleyan University that used turbulent peace, USIP's big tome of uh, what is uh, peace and conflict studies as its textbook. And uh, one of the issues that we were discussing was a series of articles on the youth bulge. Um, this issue is often oversimplified, saying that if you've got a large or an overly large population of young men um, in a country, that country is more likely to fall into destabilization. It's more likely to become a failed state. And there are various indexes that use this demographic indicator as such. Um, in fact, the youth bulge theory is much more complex and lays out a series of political, economic, and social structures that when combined with a large population of youth, such as institutional overcrowding at universities, unemployment, young men with no family, or no, they're not married, they um, are in severe cases of poverty, amplifies it, these grievances and makes it rational for young people to engage through violence, to engage their national community through violence rather than peace. And given that today has one of the largest populations of youth the world has ever seen, with almost 53% of the population in the world under 30, I thought, well, I wanted to examine a little bit more what are the nuances, what roles do youth actually play? And I thought that if we put this in a post-conflict context, it might be a little bit easier to evaluate whether young people, a uh, large population of young people, is really uniformly contributing to destabilization, or whether there are other roles that youth play potentially for peace building. And specifically, how do we change those structures outlined in the um, youth bulge theory such that we can make this opportunity cost structure lend itself to young people choosing to contribute to their uh, communities rather than choosing violence? So I thought I'd talk today about basically the key finding of the book and also the key question that the book asks. So the key finding as of the book, as one of them, as Kathleen has pointed out, is youth as change agents, youth as agent of, agents of peace in their communities and youth as agents of violence in their communities. And what this means is that youth or a youth bulge is not simply a force for instability. It's not a, we can't uniformly write them off as a large population of youth. That means instability. Youth roles can be positive and they can be negative, and specifically they can be shaped by the structures and intervening factors in the reconstruction process. So some examples of youth roles. Youth are community peace builders. Um, uh, one example that I use in the book is an organization called ProPAS in the DRC, trained, about, um, trained former youth combatants as community leaders for reconciliation um, and community peace building workshops. These youth leaders former combatants, former child soldiers, worked in over 100 different communities conducting paelstras, this combination of lectures and workshops about how to resolve conflict. They worked with landmine victims, and they, in many cases, had other young sol former soldiers come to their workshops and actually point out where arms caches were stored and build this um, support and community of reconciliation, moving on, getting rid of the arms, and moving past that. Um, Another example of a youth role is as youth as a resource for the perpetuation of violence. Um, again, uh, in, the, in the DRC, this is really evident with um, the forced re-recruitment of child soldiers into rebel armies. Even after the peace uh, treaty was finished, um, there were parties and elites that still wanted to perpetuate the conflict, specifically um, General Laurent Nakunda, who operated in eastern DRC. And um, in 2007, he had between 300 to 500 children 
in his mixed brigades, brigades that were meant to be through the demobilization process with government armies and supposed to have been uh, sort of deoperationalized from the war. There are at least 500 children in there and thousands more in danger of re-recruitment. Um, and another example of youth as a resource for violence is, uh, again in the DRC, um, a group called the OPEC Boys, um, who were unemployed youth from the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, and the Allied Democratic Forces, the AFDL in the DRC, who made a profit smuggling oil and selling it to both rebel groups, in essence perpetuating the conflict, helping them to maintain their, their reserves. Um, and... Uh, in here, we have an intervening structure of a failed DDR program, one that never got to the reintegration part and barely got to the disarmament and demobilization. And you also combine that with absolutely no alternatives for young people, no opportunities for employment, no opportunities for education, and um, a real stigma associated with being a child soldier, especially for girls. Very hard for them to move back into their communities and be accepted. And so it makes them very, very vulnerable for re-recruitment um, and to be a resource for violence. Um, a third role would be as a coordinated political voice. Um, this example I found is best showed in the Kosovo case, where um, after the violence, you see youth sort of swelling in these refugee camps and spontaneously mobilizing on their own to provide help to their peers in need through health programs, education programs, cleaning up the camps. And this sort of energy was noticed by the international community who was able to help them organize, uh, give them a structure, and this spontaneous mobilization was eventually turned into uh, the Kosovo Youth Network and the Kosovo Youth Congress, which met annually in the years following um, the violence, and they gave voice to youth concerns, they met with politicians, and they maintained an updated youth action plan outlining youth priorities for policy in a new Kosovo. And, and here you have an intervening factor of recognizing the energy of youth um, in an organized way from the international community and um, really letting them drive the program um, in, in doing so, giving them a voice in politics and a voice in their future. Um, and finally, another youth role I would point out is youth apathy. No, no real role. And, and ex coincidentally, the best example of this is also in Kosovo, where over half of the youth population when surveyed a few years after the conflict said they felt they needed to leave Kosovo, that the only option for them for a better life was leaving, was going to get an education elsewhere, was going to get a job elsewhere, and they weren't invested in the process. And so this sort of leads into the, the big question the book asks. Um, one of my favorite things about the book is that it doesn't provide all the answers. It really asks a lot of questions and looks at these cases to find questions. And um, that question for me is how to bridge child advocacy programs that are much needed with long-term youth empowerment programs and policy. And let me break that down just a little bit. Um, child protection, there's a really extensive legal framework that exists since 1989 for the protection of children, especially children affected by conflict. The UN has the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which was established in 89, and there are further sort of additions to that that protect the rights of children affected by conflict. But these Frame, these provide a framework for places like UNICEF, places like Save the Children, to protect children in conflict, but they only apply to children under 18, and they really lend themselves to an adult-dominated process that doesn't recognize youth agency um, in, their, in their own right. Um, and an empowerment program um, would not only provide young people with something to do in their spare time, a way to contribute to their community, but it provides them skills with which to have their voice heard in the political dialogue of their country and skills with which that they could go on to the future to be productive adult citizens in their community. And two quick examples here, again, here both from the DRC. In the DRC, um, Save the Children started a program called the Community Child Protection Networks. And here the goal was really to spread the word about how we can protect children affected by conflict because there was such sort of rampant impunity for human rights um, for children and there was horrible uh, treatment of child soldiers. And so they organized these networks of local authorities, religious leaders, businessmen, and children, except there was basically no participation of children in these groups at all. It was really 
um, adult-dominated, adult-led, and it didn't um, address their, their potential to be agents in their own right, and it didn't address the underlying structures of the violence. On the, on the flip side of that, in the DRC, um, again, Safe for the Children, Search for Common Ground, and UNICEF sponsored a, a radio program called Sisi Watoto, which was an award-winning program that trained young reporters to uh, do their own entire program on how to uh, access demobilization programs, how to get resources for health, um, where to find a demobilization center, um, they had personal accounts from other young people about demobilization success stories, and they interviewed people in their communities about what was going on in the conflict and, and things like this. So not only were the young people, did they have something to do that was productive with their time, they were giving important information to their peers about how to get out of um, the army, how to find a demobilization center, how to access health care. And they were also being trained in a potential career um, that they could use and feel like they had a way to transition into adulthood and into their community. Um, now, that is to say that while these empowerment programs can be really successful for the children and youth that they touch, um, they're, they can be, they're aimed at the medium term. They take it away from the short-term emergency, let me give you health care and protection that really is child advocacy programs, and takes it into the medium term of really trying to find a sense of community reintegration and a sense of belonging. But they're not long-term, and they're not really solving the, the long-term policy issues of, of unemployment, of access to land, of, of being able to marry and manage that dual transition from war to peace and from child to adulthood. And um, so the question that I think that the book asks is how do we find this bridge with all three needed programs in the short term from protection, in the medium term to reintegration and empowerment in that context? And I think the missing link is how do we link that up with policy solutions that are long-term integrating youth into the reconstruction, the peace agenda. Um, and I think that if we look at conflicts today and the model of reconstruction and state building we're seeing today, it's especially important to keep these youth issues in mind. Um, I'm not here to say that youth issues are necessarily the linchpin of a reconstruction process and whether you pay attention to youth is going to be the defining um, act, point, um, function of the reconstruction process. It's not. But it's a significant part. And youth can have a, re a real impact on the grassroots level for peace in their communities, and they can have a real impact as a resource for violence, uh, either being manipulated by, or, by elites or in their own right. And um, the, the young generation is especially important to keep in mind if we consider the implications for sustainable peace. Um, if we think about it, the, this is the next generation of leaders for their country and how young people experience the process of reconstruction, how they feel they've benefited from a peace regime is going to affect their perception of what peace can achieve in the future and is going to affect their perception of how they can interact as a citizen in the future, whether that's productive through nonviolent means or whether violence is the only way to grab attention. Um, so I, I think that one of the things that I really love about the book is that it, it really points to the need of continuing research. It points to how much we don't know about youth um, and that we need to continue this research on how to break the cycle of violence and, and recognizing that youth are agents of change in their community to tap into their potential as peace builders and really focus on changing those structures through programming and through policy so that we can move that short-term protection for children to um, a long-term uh, dynamic focused on empowering young people. So uh, the panelists will go into each of these issues more in depth, um, but that is, I think, the real um, basic arguments of, of the book. Um, so thanks very much. Now I've asked uh, Shabon Mikoivoy Levy to begin our discussion and really to pick up where uh, Stephanie left off. How, how can youth be agents of peace and uh, how can intervening policy and programs be more attentive? 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here to talk about Stephanie Schwartz's book. Uh, I told her just before I, uh, the beginning that I plan to assign this book for my senior seminar, and then I'm hoping that's going to inspire uh, my students to, uh, to follow in her footsteps. And it's, it's a really good example, I think, of the kind of um, work that we need to see happening where young people themselves are writing the books that are going to uh, set the agenda for for academic work and, and um, policy. And unfortunately, it's all too rare because uh, older people like to uh, protect their territory. And so I'm really glad to see that USIP is promoting this. Um, my, my role, as I understand it, is to, to answer this question and to bring in some other cases that are not in the book. Uh, my own field work is in um, Northern Ireland and most recently in Israel and Palestine. So uh, since it's about reconstruction after an agreement, I think I will focus on Northern Ireland. Um, but say a little bit about those other cases as well. Um, as Stephanie really eloquently uh, shows in the book, young people are active participants in war and in organized violence after war, and they're also active participants in a variety of peace groups. And they participate in cultural production and reproduction that's very important for both promoting continued uh, conflict and violence or preventing it. Um, and youth agency in all of these spheres has multiple impacts. It, it has impacts not only on, on policy, on policy makers, and it does, and I'll hopefully give you some examples of that in a few minutes, but it also Im influences other youth, it influences family, it influences communities. So there are all these interwoven networks, and, and I would argue youth are key connectors between a variety of different social spheres. Um, as agents have changed, then they are, they're shaping not only concrete facts on the ground, but also perceptions, and perceptions that help um, shape whether or not conflict is perceived to be necessary to continue or whether this agreement can hold. Um, in, in the Israeli-Palestinian context, for example, the young settlers who are young people who went to protest the Gaza disengagement, they had a concrete impact on elongating that, um, that conflict. And they also had an important symbolic effect um, and in interviews with their parents and with other adults. It's clear that they've had a, a, an important sort of rallying symbolic effect that has had some long-term uh, traction. Now, in Northern Ireland, I think that, that it may be better to compare with the Kosovo case or possibly also more with the U.S. contemporary case here where we um, have concerns about young people being recruited to a variety of armed groups from gangs to, um, to other militant organizations here and overseas. Um, but at least we can say that it's a post-conflict reconstruction context where there's been 12 years or more of experience that we can, we can look at. Um, and while it's the success case, I guess, um, it, it's also, as you can probably notice from recent events, today, yesterday, and the same last year, uh, th there's continuing instability around orange parades at particular times of the year, and these very much involve young people. So there's a small segment of the youth population in, in Northern Ireland that's a continuing force of this instability through public disorder and crime and potential recruitment into dissident groups. And Republican dissident groups are actively recruiting young people today. And I think it's possible to link these events with the structures of the peace process itself. For one thing, there is continued exclusion of, of working class young people, particularly young men. Um, their low educational achievement, particularly in the Protestant community, but also in the Catholic community, long term unemployment, the unemployment rates in the areas that were most affected by the conflict where most of this ongoing violence is taking place, including the riots last night and the night before, um, have over 50 percent uh, unemployment rates. And there's also a long social legacy of trauma associated with the conflict. And there has been very little in terms of trauma counseling or healing or transitional justice focused on young people or families indeed in general. So there are a lot of families who, um, who suffer from various forms of dysfunction, depression, addiction to tranquilizers that have, you know, that are ongoing from the conflict. Um, and, and so there's a great deal of that social, social um, mix that's, that's, that's very important. There's been also been little progress on shared space and creating shared space where young people from both communities can meet. Um, and get to know each other, not to mention there's not much shared sp individual space for young people themselves. 
Um, and there's one youth worker who uh, was working in North Belfast uh, pointed out to me, he said, at least when the Brits were coming down in their tanks, we knew what the, what, there's the physical manifestation, manifestation of my misery. Today, we're not sure where the physical manifestation of my misery is, but since we have this history of taking to the streets, um, we are, our young people are continuing to take to the streets in generations that were born after the peace process. There are some eight and nine-year-olds, for example, out rioting who, who don't remember the original <coughs> conflict. Um, so recreational rioting, as we call it in Northern Ireland, is one, um, one piece of this or manifestation of youth exclusion from, a, from the peace process. The other is, is youth joining gangs. There's, a, there's a, a youth group with quite young children in it called the Divis Hoods Liberation Army, the youth gang. And they're only involved in, in crime, local-level crime, but you can tell from the name, probably those of you who are familiar with the Northern Irish conflict, that they are mimicking the Irish Liberation Army, and that, um, that the Irish National Liberation Army, by calling themselves the Divis Hoods Liberation Army. Now, they don't have a political agenda, but this is a kind of mimicking of the past in a way that you can uh, link with, with the lack of truth-telling, the lack of storytelling about history, um, that, that, that we can see because there just hasn't been this, um, this fear or forum for young people to be part of that. Why are they important? Well, because they shape local people's perceptions of whether this peace process and Sinn Féin's involvement in it is worthwhile, and also because the dissident groups have been able to use them as a way of, of gaining status. Um, one group, for example, Oglina Heron, uh, issued death threats against these children uh, because of their crime in a local newspaper um, as a way of building uh, status because local people want something to be done by these young hooligans that they see to be out of control. So there is a way, uh, there's, that's an example of a concrete way in which young people who have been excluded in numerous ways, too numerous to really talk about here, have a concrete impact on the peace process by, um, by invigorating dissidents. Um, I've mentioned that there's a lack of trauma support and a lack of transitional justice for young people. Um, the, there are existing rights-based consultation mechanisms. We have a, 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 a children's uh, minister uh, and so on. But there, many people would say that they don't really um, adequately consult with the young people who should be consulted with. They usually go with people who are easy to access and easy um, to consult with. Um, and some of the organizations though, that are doing good work um, include the ex-prisoners organizations who are just now realizing that with 15,000 ex-prisoners, all with maybe three children or more, that there's a massive population of young people who've been affected by the conflict. Other groups like Public Achievement and Include Youth have been doing very important work that unfortunately I don't have time to talk about now uh, between young people and the police and young people and politicians and really connecting them with those police and politicians in ways that haven't been done before and provide good models, I think. Because the, the, key, uh, the key issue that I want, will conclude with is that in the peace process very much in Northern Ireland, and I can see it elsewhere, did not uh, take into consideration young people as both victim survivors and um, activists in an ongoing way. And uh, young people haven't been included haven't been connected with politicians, and when they have been consulted, nothing has been done. So they will say, we've given all this information, where's the policy change? And as one youth worker said, the least the politicians can do is say, we didn't make this change as recommended, but they never even get that response. Um, and along, so along with genuine participation, uh, a transitional justice mechanism, um, and a development mechanism that links these pieces so that there is... Um, there are skills to be developed and built through t participating in transitional justice and participating in political activity that are helpful for future job um, career prospects. Um, lastly, the importance of, of, of having training in nonviolent mechanisms of protest. Um, we can see how that was a, a failure or a problem with this most recent, the recent events in Northern Ireland. And um, we can also see how it has such tremendous potential in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict if um, adequately um, supported. So I'll stop there. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Siobhan. <laughs> We're going to move on uh, in a similar vein to Lebanon, though, and ask Wissam Samat.
to talk about uh, some of these processes going on there and sure. from a very youthful uh, perspective. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. At first, I'd like to say something like a joke. Uh, once I have a presentation in my university, and my professor was introducing me as a peace activist, and here they introduced me as a biochemist, so <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> so the people in that room were like, what are you doing here? <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm studying biochemistry, but at the same time, I started my own peace movement with my friends in Lebanon after War 2006. So let me tell you my experience from 2006 until today, what happened. In 2006, uh, I'm living in South Lebanon, and I was caught in the war. And after one week of the war, I became a refugee because we lost our house, and we have to move to Beirut City. I found myself, I cannot fit in the cycle of violence. I'm not there. I didn't find myself in that place, although a lot of youths were there, and they were fighting, and they want to fight more. I couldn't stay in that status. And I decided with my friends that I met them in Beirut, and we decided to start supporting the refugees that are not having the chance to be living in houses. Because what happened is that when we were displaced, we were living in people's houses, but some people were just like simply living in the parks and in the streets. So what we did is that we started supporting the refugees, and we were a small group, and the refugees were like more than 800,000, like some around a million after 20 days of the war. And what we try to do is to start integrating young refugees that are living in the streets, start asking them to volunteer with us and to start helping their parents and helping their children to do some work, to do something that they feel they are not able, that they have like other choices than being in violence. And at that time, we were doing a lot of activities for young people, psychosocial support activities like theater, poetry, conducting work trainings, even during the war in a very hard situation and very stressful. But what worked that in that time is that a lot of young people were telling us that thank you for being with us in this very hard situation because we were going to fight and we were going to be integrated in violence if we didn't have the chance to be in such uh, activities and such, like, between two brackets projects, although it wasn't a real project. It was something that was born randomly and... Um, without any preparation, without having uh, like an agenda or, uh, or like design project. It was just like uh, doing activities. Uh, and people, will, as you start implementing some activities, people will be guiding you more than you are guiding them. And this was really a turning point for the, me and my friends because after the war, we decided to keep this group on growing and we decided to start working on the real issue, on the real factors that are making the conflict more and more complicated is the violence that people are integrated in and especially young people are convinced that this violence is giving their their lives a meaning so we started to raise awareness on non-violence on peace you have the other choice you have the right to choose and we noticed something on this young people as we were in contact with them more that they are raised on the idea that are passive and they don't they can't make a change for what's happening around them. And we are trying to tell them, no, what's happening around you is because of you. It's because of what you are accepting. So if you just become more coordinating in the politics that's happening and become more organized and let your voice be heard in a very strong movement, you can make the change. And you are not the leaders of tomorrow, as they always tell you. You are the leaders of today, of now. You have to go and move. And we started the movement based on these principles that we believe that are really effective and we started integrating a lot of youth people and going to villages driving my car every day from village to another stopping by organizations stopping in clubs in schools addressing the issues telling people that non-violence is the solution it's not violence if it was violence the solution it should be ended from years ago but since we didn't end the conflict yet because of the violence that we are going through it all the time and, it's, and I, we try to address more. Is it your life worth fighting for it in this way? I don't know. So what happened uh, until today, the peace movement is growing and growing faster. But we have a lot, a lot of challenges. Uh, and the challenges are not only from the external politics, especially from the internal politics. The political parties in my country are not liking us at all. They are not supporting me. <laughs> 
I'm not that welcomed uh, to be on board <laughs> whenever there's a conference or a meeting. So whenever they see me, they will be like looking at me as if I'm the intruder here. And I was looking for the safe space. I started looking for a safe space for, my, for the movement. How can we put this movement in a safe space so more youth will be feeling secure and can join us? Because I heard and I knew a lot of people that I met, they were talking about, yeah, we like, we like to be with you, we support you, but we cannot say it out loud. Or maybe if someday you will be like after a few years um, having some people uh, for the elections from the movement and starting becoming integrated in the parliament, in the government. But we cannot vote for you because we are scared. Simply. So we started looking for a safe space. I started meeting UN. I found the United Nations in my country would be the safe space. And I started meeting people from the United Nations and talking about how can we start integrating youth in the movement in a way that makes it safe space for them and through the UN. So we, now we are designing micro projects. I will not say a big project. Micro projects to be implemented in different villages and different regions where we can start integrating them and interactive way, like theater, conducting poetry workshops, kind of filmmaking, documenting, uh, researches. So anyway, they will start working in the movement and having a job to do in this movement. So they will be uh, finding themselves that this is what we are doing is correct and is making our lives more effective and more meaningful. So why we don't stay in it? To end, I'd just like to address three different points I've experience that I've, that I've learned uh, through my experience in the war and after the war especially is that youth participation is mandatory in peace and more in conflict. The more you, you, you let the youth people participate in what you are doing, the more you are making the, breaking the cycle of violence and ending it. And because of what I heard a lot of the young people were telling me during the war, you are making us active. That word was really, really uh, too much a uh, big word for me, making us active. Just imagine some people are feeling passive all the time, and suddenly just because they are integrated in an activity, they are feeling active. The other point I'd like to address is in post-conflict. After the war, what made us to keep this movement ongoing is that we believe that in post-conflict is the work that ha will, should happen more than during the war. In post-conflict, it's very important. It's very important to find the ch channels for young people to keep on working and to keep them on going on, and keep, uh, pushing them forward to do what they are doing and to develop it more and more. And this is what we are doing now with the UN. This is what we are trying to find now: is that the safe space that I talked about before, as post-conflict reconstruction and shaping youth in a well-organized and coordinated structure where they can become a power of mass, which we believe in it, that they can make the change that we want to see. They can be, simply. Third, youth policies. Youth policies, here I'm addressing government. The government, we don't have any youth policy at all different levels, health, education. We don't have any youth policy. So we are trying now with the UNESCO. Uh, we are working, UNESCO, one of the UN agencies also. Uh, we are working on uh, we, we, uh, we worked actually and we've reached a very good uh, uh, result is we founded like a, we went all to the, to the political parties and we selected young people that have leadership characters and we asked them to sit and all of us to have an open dialogue for more than four years working on uh, starting a uh, sorry I forgot the word in English <laughs> Uh, okay, they were they were working like on policy and constructing a policy from uh, from the scratch, and then they started uh, reforming it in a way that could uh, match with the constitution of the country and the agenda of the government. Because unless it will fail from the agenda if it's not matching with it. And uh, the good news that I received weeks ago from my friends uh, that they had the first meeting with the prime minister and it passed uh, the first uh, signature. So now it's like moving in a bureaucracy forum, but which, is, which means like after a year it should be integrated in the policy and we have a youth policy that uh, uh, will talk, uh, that address the young people, uh, health issues and education in conflicts and in, in uh, post-conflict zones. Okay. Uh, in the end, I'd just like to thank you all for your attention. 
And I just want to uh, say one thing that we really all the time see say it in my country with my friends. There is no path to peace. Peace is the only path. So thank you. to uh, Shaban and to Assam for really laying out this idea of, of youth as actors, the choices for peace, the choices for violence, and really uh, lending your own experiences to that part of our story here. We're going to shift to a second uh, part of the book, which really looked at clarifying that the needs that youth have are very distinct from children's needs. And uh, uh, Stephanie foreshadowed this. And we're going to turn to our own senior fellow here at the United States Institute of Peace, Mark Summers, who is a social cultural anthropologist and has really looked at youth as a cohort in war and in post-conflict. And Mark, I'd ask you to take the podium. We definitely need clarification on how the youth experience is different and uh, what are some of the things we need to shape and understand this transition to adulthood. This is going to be difficult. She gave me eight minutes, and now i got more things to address. Uh, I wanted to just uh, – I was just thinking and t- listening to all these uh, – the first three presentations, um, and uh, – uh, it, I just made some notes before I share some remarks, and that is one of the things that, that Stephanie mentioned, and I think it might be useful to think about in the discussion period, is this issue of community. And I think the question is, what do we mean by a community? And do do most youth have the same definition? My argument would be no way. And another question would be, do they really want to join the communities that we define? My argument would be, from my research, is probably not most of them, particularly urban youth. It's not even possible. Uh, So their definition of community quite often is profoundly different than what we have. And um, the other thing is, is that with reintegration, it's very, it, it, it implies this idea of going back to something that existed before the war, and I think every youth knows that's not possible. Um... And so these are big challenges. And I think that um, Stephanie's terrific book, and it really is a terrific book, um, raised um, some really important questions on these issues. And I think I like the way she framed things in terms of the short, the immediate, uh, medium and and longer term. Um, I'm also going to talk as uh, with reference to this issue of alienation and exclusion that um, Siobhan was uh, mentioning, uh, emphasizing, and... uh, they're often called the marginalized youth. Um, and that, in most of these post-war countries, would include just about all youth, certainly the overwhelming majority of youth. Um, and I think part of that is something that uh, Wissam mentioned, which is this idea of looking for a safe space and how hard that is to do, particularly if you're seen as bad or uh, as dangerous. Um, the, the, where is that safe space? I really, I thought that was a really powerful idea that you, that you brought up. Um, so, um, so I'm going to talk about policies and programs uh, for youth uh, in these post-war sort of situations. What I wanted to do first is mention three ideas that sort of frame the discussion, and I'm drawing on sort of the work I've done uh, uh, now for about 20 years on these issues of youth uh, during and after wars. And then I'm going to look at uh, three findings from the two book projects I'm working on here, one on youth in Rwanda, the other on youth in war in Sierra Leone. And and then I'll end with two recommendations, uh, one on policy and one on on programs. So the three framing ideas. Uh, The first one is that post-war populations are youth-dominated, which is something that Stephanie uh, uh, said so eloquently. Um, But um, while the... The, the populations are youth-dominated, but youth government policies in general are not youth-centered. It's not really about youth. Even when youth um, uh, comp- comprise uh, three-quarters of the population or more, um, like in uh, Uganda, uh, which is the youngest population in the world. I think Rwanda is second and Afghanistan is third or fourth. These are very, very young uh, populations in these post-war countries. Um, 
A second issue is that although youth are a demographically dominant population, uh, most act as if they're an outcast min uh, minority. And this is a big problem when we're talking about ideas of community and reconstruction. If they feel that they don't belong in the, from the get-go, it's a big challenge. The third issue is that, and, and this has to do also with demographics, is that most youth will never, ever, ever get in a program. There are far too many youth. Um, and so that what, what that means is that in the longer term, um, policies matter much more than programs. And I think when you're thinking about programs and so many people feel excluded, will a program exacerbate the sense of exclusion that youth already feel? I'll, I'll get back to that in a moment. So some lessons learned from recent research that I'm doing. The first two are from Rwanda. Uh, the first one is uh, the need to find out through quality research what youth priorities are. Not youth values, but youth priorities. Not what they want to do, but what they have to do. What they're, what they're going to setting out to do. Um, <clears throat> there's a housing crisis in Rwanda. Uh, and what we found in debriefing uh, donors is that none of them knew that. And yet it was absolutely, it was as plain as, as day for every Rwandan official, government official uh, in sector, cell, and even in district levels. Um, uh, very few male youth are able to build a house. Since male youth have to build a house before they can marry and become men, uh, and female youth need to marry to become women, um, adulthood hinges on housing. If a young man can't build a house, nobody can get married. And if nobody can get married, nobody can be seen as an adult. And that's what's going on in Rwanda. Virtually, I mean, very, very few youth in Rwanda right now are able to become adults. Um, as a result, helping male youth build a house helps male and female youth become adults. So this is a kind of a, a finding which has a challenge to the notion of empowerment and particularly gender empowerment and how that's done. The reliance of femininity, of womanhood, becoming a woman on male youth becoming men was something that was really powerful in the research uh, done in Rwanda. A second <laughs> issue is the importance of urban youth in, pro in the program and policy mix. Rwanda's rate of urbanization is the second highest in the world. Um, Two-thirds of all residents of the capital city, it is estimated, uh, in Kigali are youth. A significant proportion of Kigali's urban youth are socially isolated and <coughs> desperately poor. Um, our research found that Rwanda's most at-risk youth popula population, the most at-risk youth population, are poor female youth, many of whom are prostitutes. A third of our sample female youth in the capital were prostitutes. That was the commonest occupation of poor female youth in the capital in Kigali. So I want to switch now to um, Sierra Leone and uh, research from Sierra Leone. Um, and this has to do with the risk involving access to youth programming, which is something I mentioned at the beginning. Um, for many Sierra Leonean youth, um, what matters much more than whether you be, you're called an, a man and a or a woman, becoming an adult, is the hatred of being labeled an outcast. This idea of being called a dropout is very strong and apparently, um, from my research, and we can ask Susan Sheplin here, Shepler here in the third row uh, about this as well, uh, is that um, this, this goes back quite a ways. This hatred of being a called a dropout was something that adults talked about as well. They really hate that, hated that as when they were younger. Um, so is the sense that nepotism determines who gets into most youth programs. And this is, this is um, the point I wanted to make about this. It turns out that um, uh, the, the, these two issues, nepotism and feeling like you don't belong, being an outcast, being a dropout, is potentially quite dangerous and are certainly volatile. And it suggests the following conclusion that many youth programs may be making the overall youth situation, not the, that is, those not in the program, uh, may, be, may be making the overall situation worse by unintentionally, and I do um, uh, emphasize unintentionally, demonstrating exclusive access to programs. Somebody's got to get into a program in Sierra Leone. There's no way that most youth are going to get in. The thing about Sierra Leone, which is very different from Rwanda, if you mention, you know, in talking about youth programs in Rwanda, most of them have no idea what you're talking about because there are no youth programs in most of Rwanda. But in, in Sierra Leone, they're very aware of them. And something that was very interesting in Sierra Leone is that the DDR program, 
for ex-combatants was thought of as a very good youth program. Too short, but it was a youth, it was seen as a youth empowerment program. Um, I have to wrap up, so let me get to my recommendations. The first one on youth programming. Uh, a well-known challenge that we have uh, in this post-war uh, world uh, regarding youth is that most youth programs are either not evaluated or not well evaluated. Now, this is an important weakness in this context of, of significant exclusion um, because evaluations, quality evaluations, in my view, need to look at youth who are not in programs to see how they perceive of their own situation and how they see these, uh, what's going on in the programs. Um, and you have to carefully examine the issue of who gets in. If most people feel excluded, then the issue of inclusion into these precious programs becomes more and more important um, because people are so desperate, youth are so desperate to get access into these programs. Um, so setting up a youth program for a handful of youth when a country teems with outcast youth runs the risk of stirring the pot and making alienated youth feel more desperate and fatalistic, which is, a, I think, a serious danger that we don't, that we need to pay attention to more. And finally, uh, on policy, I think the the, um, the approach we used with Rwandan youth for the World Bank, this is a it was a World Bank funded research, um, was surprisingly effective, and I think it could easily be applied to other contexts. And the framework was very simple: um, you find out what the youth priorities are. And then you shape policies that address youth priorities. That's really unusual. Usually you don't ask uh, poor youth anything. You're, they're stupid. They're, they don't have education. It's not their fault. They lack development, as they would say in Rwanda. Um, and so you have to give them ideas because they don't have education. What we found is that if you do that, you're going to do things like emphasize uh, education and youth won't go. They can't go because they have to build this house. They have to focus on becoming adults. So there's a disjuncture if you start with what they should do um, as opposed to what youth priorities, what they need to do. And I, my son's now 20 and, you know, should just doesn't go with, with uh, youth is what one of the things I've learned as a dad. Um, so I think what you can call this is sectorless research, um, where you examine the situation of youth not from a set, of, uh, a set sector or agenda, but by, by starting by finding out what is most important to them. And I mean members of the marginalized youth majority in particular, um, and what their priorities are. If you don't do this, what you get, I think, in, uh, uh, is, is Rwanda and today, where you have a national, youth co uh, a national housing crisis and a female youth crisis in Kigali, in the, in the urban areas. So I think a lesson that we learned from this research experience in Rwanda is that you can't assume what youth need or make decisions on their behalf. And I think that this lesson aligns very well with the conclusions in Stephanie's terrific book. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And last but not least, we have Joe DeBerry, who is a social scientist at the World Bank in the Eastern Europe and Central Asian region. She's also an anthropologist by training, and her work has taken her for extensive periods to post-conflict Uganda and Afghanistan. She's going to bring us into a discussion about best practices. Stephanie laid out this short-term versus long-term perspective and how we can go from emergency programs to really looking at empowerment programs. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. And once again, congratulations, Stephanie. I, I like this book very much because it resonates very strongly with what I have seen in many post-conflict environments all across the world, which is that at the end of war, there is often a huge and tremendous desire and hope for peace amongst the young people that have been affected by that conflict. And they strongly believe often at the end of war that um, peace will be uh, a change and give them a second chance and a new opportunity. And they're very often eager to contribute to that peace and to be actively involved in it. And yet that great expectation that there often is at the end of conflict comes is often very fragile and there's a very high risk of that great expectation quickly turning to uh, disillusionment very easily. 
And so there's a critical window of opportunity at the end of a conflict to capitalize on that hope and that desire for change and that um, belief that things will be different, to capitalize on that before um, disillusionment sets in. And that's really um, our challenge as a, as a community is to how, to how to make the most of that opportunity, how to make the most of that window and um, allow and give uh, young people, foster their ability to be constructive agents during that time to build on that hope before possible disillusionment sets in. And how do we do that? How do we make reconstruction a credible and viable process for young people? How do we bridge the gap? Um, the question that Stephanie has posed, how do we bridge the gap between um, the emphasis on protection um, for, young, uh, for children's rights to empowerment of young people um, as active agents in a constructive uh, reconstruction process. Well, I've identified um, five points, and they really uh, just summarize, I think, a lot of what people have already said. So I'll go through those. How do we, how do we bridge the gap? How do we make reconstruction um, credible for young people? How do we convince young people, um, with young people, that reconstruction is going to work out for them and going to be a better deal than the war has been? First of all, um, reconstruction has to guarantee the safety and protection and the justice for um, young people. So I don't think we actually need to drop the whole um, protection focus, the emergency type protection focus entirely. Because I think a pre, uh, reconstruction process has to also be credible in, in guaranteeing young people's safety um, and allowing them justice. And I think the book is very clear in how that wasn't achieved in the DRC, and that was one of the failures of that reconstruction process. It didn't guarantee safety and justice for young people. Secondly, um, reconstruction has to deliver for young people. It has to allow them to be socially and economically viable. It has to allow them the houses that they need, um, or it has to allow them the opportunity to build their own houses that they need to progress with their life. So um, reconstruction has to deliver economically and socially for young people. A key part of that, I think, is education. Youth are often the real victims of missing out on years of education because of conflict and then it being too late for them to reintegrate into school structures because the years have gone by. And um, there are good examples, I think, now of creative um, opportunities for so-called second chance education that allows young people to recapture that education that's been um, been lost. So reconstruction has to provide safety and justice and it has to deliver economically and socially. Thirdly, and this is a, um, an area that the book doesn't touch on so much, but I'm beginning to realize is increasingly important, is that um, reconstruction has to be politically pal palatable for young people. It has to be politically sincere for them. Um, I think we still underestimate the extent to which young people are politically active before conflict, during conflict, and after conflict. Conflict. Um, the case of Kosovo is used in the book, and that's a very interesting one where, you know, 10 years, in the 10 years prior to the conflict, um, young people were at actively protesting through non-violent means, through the, the parallel education system, through refusing, through demanding that they had their lessons in Albania. And there was 10 years of peaceful political protest by young people before it got to the point that um, all those avenues were blocked and people felt that they had to protest violently. And reconstruction processes have to recognize that. They can't um, deny young people's political involvement prior to the conflict conflict, during the conflict, and after the conflict. I've done a lot of work in, uh, in eastern Uganda, and um, one of the problems with the reconstruction process there is while it did provide economically and socially for young people, the peace was viable in that respect. A lot of young people just felt that their grievances, their political grievances that had taken them to conflict in the first place weren't being listened to and weren't being resolved. So um, in the area where I work, one of the big political um, gripes was that young men had had their cattle stolen during the conflict. Without that cattle, similarly to the housing issue, you can't, you can't marry, you can't <coughs> progress to manhood. Um, so a fundamental aspect of identity had been taken away from them and young people didn't see the government um, 
touch that issue or resolve that issue whilst peace was progressing. And that means that politically it just wasn't palatable um, for young people and that made um, the potential for that reconstruction process to, to be stable a bit more limited. I see this very, very clearly in my current work in Azerbaijan where I'm working with young people who have um, grown up in displacement camps. The conflict that caused their parents to be displaced was 20 years ago and now young people have inherited that conflict even though they, some of them weren't even alive at the time. And there just is no political space for young people to be able to say, well, it's not necessarily my legacy. It was a legacy of my parents that they were displaced from that village. Of course, I want my parents to go back home, but I'm not so sure that I want to go back home. I don't, I, I'm used to an urban lifestyle. I don't want to go back to be a tractor driver or a farmer in this village that I've never actually seen. Yet the government emphasis is so strongly on you will return home, and that's the only hope that you're allowed to have. So the ideology that frames the reconstruction process is critical for allowing young people to politically engage or not engage. So um, uh, reconstruction has to be politically palatable for young people. Fourthly, um, reconstruction has to, as many people have already said, have platforms for youth voice. Um, and um, we've already heard a lot about the importance for space at the community level, whatever those communities might be, how they might be constituted, um, space at the community level for young people to express their opinions, their priorities, their hopes and their desires, and then to take action on them. But there also has to be space at the government level for young pe people's voices to be heard. One of the challenges I increasingly find is that I work... Um, you know, my partners are ministers of youth in Georgia and Azerbaijan, and they're actually often saying the right things around there have to be opportunities for young people to um, give their opinion and to engage politically. But those ministers of youth are often very marginalized within the overall government structure. There is no way that a ministry of finance is going to listen to a minister of youth when they're making budget allocations for a country and, to, and for investing in programs. Um, and that... Um, um, and that is a limitation. That, that can be a constraint. So I think spaces for young people's voice have to be at the community level, but they also have to be pushed at the government level. And lastly, as, as many in the line, unless there's also the political space for young people to be active agents of change. Thank you so much, Joe. We're going to now open our discussion to the audience, and we have mics on both sides of the floor. Um, I'd appreciate it if you would uh, come to the mic, introduce yourself, your organization, and keep your remarks brief because our time is limited, but we're happy to hear from you. Hi, uh, you. my name is Mayuri Saxena from the New School University. Um, I just wanted to um, ask the speakers if, for their opinion and just wanted to know if they thought um, – it was to, if there was any difference in engaging orphans versus uh, youth with some type of support system, whether it's just like maybe a parent or even relatives that were um, raising them by any chance in any part of the reconstruction process. And uh, I'd take a couple of questions and then is there any? Okay, we'll keep a few going. If you wouldn't mind going to the mics because we are being webcast, it will help uh, move this along. Go ahead. How are you doing? My name is Chime Sonye. First, I want to thank all the panelists for the great conversation. Stephanie, I want to thank you specifically. I'm a youth, and you inspired me. So I appreciate that. Um, I have a question for – I have one question for all the panelists, and then I have a second question for Mark. The first question is, you guys – I'm not sure who brought it up about the distinction between youth and children. Um, I'm not sure if they, they didn't get time to talk about that. I want to know if that could be expounded on a little bit more and how that implicates this conversation. And the second question, Mark, you brought up the – the idea of reintegration not being something that youth may want because it implies going back to a status quo before the war, which I thought was really interesting. And so I want to know if you can spend on that uh, concept also. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll take one more question and then open it up to the panelists to comment. My name is Benjamin Gaylord. I work for the American Councils for International Education, and we work primarily with uh, teenage uh, scholarship programs funded by the State Department for students to come to the U.S. for a year 
and study in high school, um, particularly working with Afghanistan and Kosovo in this context that I think are significant, particularly Afghanistan. And so I've got a couple of questions. One is, um, you know, we, we face our challenges with bringing youth from um, Afghanistan here for a year and then sending them back. So I'm curious about how they might fit in the constellation of different types of youth and how they might be able to really contribute as agents of change, um, given also the challenges of transitional justice or post-conflict, which of course is a very slippery term since there's still conflict in so many of these places. Um, and uh, what's the other thing? Yeah, no, I guess that, that that's... All right. Thank you, Benjamin. We'll take this first set of questions. And uh, Stephanie, since I would like you to start with this last question, actually, on the Afghanistan, and then move forward on commenting on any others, and then we'll move down the tape. Um, uh, I think um, I'm just a question sort of how to work with youth who've had experience um, abroad and how they can go back um, and... Uh, work for their communities. We've actually um, had a lot of experience with a young woman from Afghanistan named Awista Ayyub, who uh, is a diaspora herself. So she grew up in the United States and actually had little um, context of life in Afghanistan, but started uh, the first Afghani girls soccer team, which became a real sort of rallying force for young women to participate and have a... Um, voice uh, be heard. They were really sort of became a star team out there. And one of the things that Awista struggles with um, is not knowing the Afghani context. And she's had all this experience um, out here in the States. She's had a great education. But she, uh, she always comments that she never would have used soccer if she'd lived in Afghanistan. Because here it's a girl's sport, and there it's not. It's completely male-dominated. And so she put these female youth on the spot, really. Um, and so one thing I would say for young people who've had, who are coming over and spending some time here, gaining experience, gaining spill, skills, gaining education, is that they should really they also value their knowledge of the context of the issues and in order to marry the two, because that's something that a young diaspora person is, was really striving for. Okay. Do you want to pick that up and also anything that you could add to the distinction between children and youth? Okay. Uh, well, first, this, this last question. Um, an example, I think, that um, is interesting is one that I encountered with a young man who runs a program in a refugee camp outside of Bethlehem. Um, and I'm not sure where you are, but you asked the question. Um, but, and he said very clearly that for him, making the choice to, be, to, to work in this um, nonviolent project for youth development was connected with his connections with internationals, Belgians in particular, who'd come to the refugee camp, um, and a trip that he was able to take and get further education and training to Belgium. Now, that um, sort of works against this notion, I think, that's in the literature, that taking young people out of their context and then sending them back is actually detrimental because um, it, it reinforces the notion that they can't, that they have to go elsewhere to learn these skills. They have to go elsewhere to be a peace builder. That this can't be generated from the grassroots. Um, the one thing that I would say, uh, and I think there's a, there's a, there's a lot of truth to that. I've seen a lot of that in Northern Ireland, for example, um, where where it has been detrimental to take children out of their context and then send them back again after a couple of months and expect them to um, to to be peace builders then in, uh, in when they're being returned to a place that, uh, that they've been told is sort of inferior to this other uh, context. But for, for this young person in Bethlehem, his, um, it, a part of it, I think, is that he was able to be part of a very politically activist and radical movement when he got back, which is connecting uh, with what Joe was saying earlier, is that it was nonviolent direct action, but a lot of people would have seen it, a lot of Israelis certainly would have seen it as, as, as quite threatening and that we have to allow young people to be able to express themselves the way they want to um, while providing mechanisms for them to, to be trained to do that in a nonviolent way. And again, as I said in my presentation, that hasn't happened in Northern Ireland, I don't think, very well. Um, lastly, however, I did uh, groups that I have met, for example, in Ramallah, Popular Achievement is a, is a counterexample to this case uh, because there they're doing civic engagement work. They're not able to travel. Um, as much 
um, but it's very grassroots oriented and is having um, multiple impacts and particularly girls are able to be part of those kinds of activities because um, girls are less likely to be allowed by their parents to travel to go overseas and so on. Um, the youth child distinction very quickly uh, that you asked about um, is, is an important one because it's culturally defined, it's context driven, um, a young person, um, as Mark has alluded to, may be considered um, a youth until they're 40 if they haven't gone through certain rites of passage or um, haven't been able to get, to get married and so on. Um, the, the definition that, that um, Stephanie's working with, I think, is from 15 to 25 or 24. I think along those lines, which, which aligns with the UN definition. Um, so um, it's important to be, I think, to be culturally sensitive and to, to be aware of those um, differences from, from context to context. But then again, looking at what Mark has said, sometimes it, do, it doesn't help you to be culturally sensitive. Um, sometimes young people don't want to have, have that whoever is coming in as, as part of an intervention um, utilize the, the models that elders want them to utilize of who is a child, who is a youth in paper society, and want that, that change, that shift, um, and, and would rather work with these international definitions that give them some more uh, power and potential political role. Thank you, Siobhan. Wissam, do you want to weigh in on um, also the, uh, can you comment on the orphan question, the first question that was discussed? Uh, in conflict, and um, I, I take uh, to expand that also to uh, displaced people, as you exactly about. working and engaging the orphans is more challenging and it's harder for uh, because if he's an orphan, but, uh, like he lost his parents when he was young, or he lost his parents due to the war, you are dealing with double uh, conflicts not a personal conflict and other conflict that's the, oh, the uh, social conflict that he is living in. So we, we worked with, with orphans before, but to be honest, we didn't find them like, that effective and motivated as, pe as young people who are living with their parents now. So it's very challenging to work with them, especially they are living in an orphanage and they don't have the same lifestyle of, uh, that they used to live before because of what they lost to, uh, after becoming orphans. And it's quite, quite different, yeah. And uh, for the distinction between youth and children, it's very important not to work with young people and children at the same time or in the same group. We we'll always try to segregate, like young people will be alone and children will be alone because children, they, are, they, have, they see it differently and young people, they, they've experienced more and they know more about what they are doing. So we try to work on children more on very like in general principles and when we work on young, with young people, we work on more uh, specified and more oriented toward what we are really addressing them. So these are two basic differences. We should all the time be aware of it when we're working with people. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle. Mark, do you want to pick up the question that was asked to you directly on uh, reintegration? Sure. And I have a couple of things on a couple of other, the other questions. Briefly. Okay. Uh, on the reintegration question, it's a very good one. I think the problem is in the, in the prefix, in re. Uh, I think the issue is in integration in new terms. I mean, war is different. And I think when, you know, this awareness, I mean, one of the things that comes out of this um, youth bulge uh, demographics that, that Stephanie is using sort of as a, a platform for discussing these issues is that most youth or many youth in these countries just can't become adults uh, in the traditional ways. It's not possible. And, and so uh, the issue of reintegration is ridiculous. Uh, for most youth, particularly in a city. Uh, migration to a city means you're not going back to reintegrate anyway. Uh, in the, the Reintegration generally has a very rural connotation in a lot of these um, post-war situations. And, most, and, and huge numbers of youth aren't going back. I mean, Kinshasa is mammoth, just to give an example. Pristina tripled in size. Um, and... Uh, before, d during, before, sent from before to after the war. Um, and uh, there's very little evidence that once youth go to a capital that they ever leave. So um, I, I think the issue is, is um, the, the reintegration has, has gives us uh, sort of this idea, which I think is false, um, that we can actually go back to something before that peace can, uh, after a war, can in some way, rec you know, be similar to what took place before the war, and I, I just don't think that that's realistic. Um, so, with regards to this issue of um, 
uh, youth as agents of change, can they be uh, after this program that, you're, that Benjamin, you're talking about, which sounds really interesting. I think the problem is, I don't want to be a Marxist here, but this issue of, uh, of class is just so wildly overlooked uh, in looking at youth issues, and it's so important. So if a young man or woman from Kosovo or Afghanistan is lucky enough, my God, to get to America, when they get back, I would imagine, from my experience, that most youth are going to say, uh-huh. Now, this one's come back, gets all the advantages, and now we're supposed to listen to them as a leader? They don't even know what we've been going through this while they've been, you know, enjoying themselves in the superpower, you know, out in Washington or something. So they have less credibility than before they left, I would imagine, uh, particularly among, you know, again, the marginalized majority. So it's a big challenge. I mean, it's something that you can discuss. I think some evaluation on that might be interesting if, to help people prepare. But I think you're really going to have uh, you, your work cut out for you. Um, on youth and children, unfortunately, and it's the way it is, that um, the definition has to do with a, a child is anybody who's under the age of 18. Um, you know, people grow up fast in wars. Uh, and uh, I was thinking when this question was raised in uh, southern Sudan, a lot of times in, in, um, in demobilization uh, or in uh, DDR processes for uh, 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 soldiers, um, that uh, if you're a child soldier, you go to UNICEF and you get education and things like that. And if you're 18, you get money. So um, they had this program for the Southern Sudanese uh, child soldiers outside of Rumbek. And, uh, and UNICEF just, you know, I mean, they were doing their job, but they didn't, they, they had these guys, you know, former uh, combatants, they were 15, 16. And they, when they realized that they weren't gonna get any money and their colleagues who were just a little bit older, 18, were going to get money. They, they, there was an uproar. And basically, one of the kids said, said, uh, said, he said, you're calling me a child? I think he was 15. You want to meet my wife? I got three children. You want to meet my children? And you're calling me a child? I'm a man. And, you know, and then UNICEF's like, well, the regulations say you have to be. <laughs> so I can be a challenge. Um, and the last thing on, uh, on orphans. Um, most people don't know if they're orphans or not in a war. They run away, and they don't know where their parents are. Why is this important? Um, the issue of orphanages was mentioned. The thing that I found so scary and really quite terrifying is that you cannot find um, young women or girls who um, are, don't know where their parents are. They get picked up. They are, they are a commodity, and they get picked up on the streets and they're being used for domestic labor, or who knows? Uh, in in uh, Kosovo, they're picked up and they go right to Moldova and then off to you know, London and so forth as prostitutes. So it's, uh, it's terrifying what happens to them. And I think one of the things we need to wonder about is, you know, who's not there? Who aren't you seeing? Because uh, in these sort of situations, what goes on with young girls is, uh, during and after wars is absolutely frightening. And, just because they're not there to tell us doesn't mean it's not happening. So, Joe, I, I'm, I'm hoping that you want to weigh in and add a little bit more, but I think we've covered a lot, and I don't I see any other questions at the moment. Oh, please come forward. I, I can only see you if you're standing up at the mic, if you have questions. Go ahead, Joe, while uh, people are approaching the mic. Yes, just um, pick it and up. And if you could the... move the mic close to your... Thank you. Um, on the theme of um, the program for young people coming over and, and this danger that we see um, again and again in youth programming it, is that the programming itself creates its own elite of young people um, and you find familiar faces of the same young people going around uh, getting um, the majority of the opportunities and um, then becoming a kind of a spokesperson for young people of their country that they're actually getting further and further away from. Um, I work in Georgia at the moment and actually interesting you can't you know, you can't fault the Georgian government on, on not having political space for young people. Half the cabinet is, they call them Misha's kindergarten, half the cabinet is, <laughs> is under 24 years old. Um, so there's certainly, um, you know, there's certainly political influence of young people. But who those young people are is quite interesting. Almost all of them have had an American university education. And um, that's really why they've ended up being in the cabinet in the government of Georgia, um, because of the incredible 
opportunities that they have. Do they speak for, do they understand, do they represent the majority of Georgian young people? Absolutely not. Increasingly, there's a great divide between rural young people who don't have those same opportunities and um, the Tbilisi crowd who are claiming to speak for them. And I think as a community, it's something that we just have to be very responsible about because we are part and parcel of um, contributing to that phenomena. Excellent. I think we have a very clear theme here that uh, we can add to the storyboard on uh, elite and class issues. I'm going to take all three questions. We're really at the edge of our time, but I want your questions to be heard, and we will do our best to answer them. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Michael Schipler. I'm from Search for Common Ground, and thank you to USIP for uh, addressing this issue of youth when people advocating to deal with the issues of youth and conflict for, for a long time, and it's nice to see it have a platform like this here in Washington. Um, my question, or it's, it's sort of a comment, but I wanted to put, put to, to the panel here, um, is about the objective, the purpose of interventions for youth and conflict, and, and this notion of youth as agents of change and the objectives of it. Why do we actually do it? What are we trying to achieve? And the conversation is often very confused because we mix purposes. We mix the purpose of protection, of poverty alleviation, and of you know, bringing about peace in a society. And the, the follow-on is then at what level do we work? Because most of the interventions are sort of petri dish level, as Mark was pointing out. You know, even the, the, the multi-million dollar education initiatives that we'll see from USAID reach 20,000 youth. In Pakistan, a country of 180 million people, what are we actually achieving there? Um, really, how do we begin to affect change at a generational level? And that's, I think, the next step for all of us who want to work, who are working on this issue, to try to find a way of, of taking that leap. And the mechanism that I fear absent from the conversation, for the most part, with the exception of our friend Wissam, uh, is about how youth respond themselves to the dynamics of, of conflict. And we know that youth are, that there's organizations uh, of all sorts at which youth are playing leadership roles, from student unions to youth wings of political parties. Trade unions are mostly youth dominated in almost every country in the world, et cetera, et cetera. You know, truck drivers' unions are one of the most powerful things. So anyway, those are, those are uh, sort of a broader question about how we affect that broader change. Thank you, Michael. That's great. Uh, we're going to go to you. Uh, so my name is uh, Nemanja Shukalov from the U.S. Baltic Foundation. Um, I have a small comment to Mr. Berry's uh, speech. Um, actually, being of Serbian origin, I can state that the protests have not been quiet throughout the 90s, and one of the main reasons for the intervention was the constant oppression of the Serbian population as well in the north. However, I think the case with Kosovo is slightly different. I, I, I believe that the youth there is, um, in a way, was actually more harmed by the Kosovo institutions and Kosovo politicians rather than the Belgrade government. Because if, if you look back, in 1974, they were granted the region of Kosovo their, their autonomous status. They have had basically their freedom in a way. But I think that the politicians had a completely different way different vision in front of them. And we know what happened later on and with the unilateral declaration of independence. But if we look at the current development there, that we also tend to forget what happens to the Serbian youth in Kosovo. Because we don't mention that. And for me as a Serb, I, I do feel offended that my people, like what we uh, some knows, that a lot of them have fled. Some to the north, some to Belgrade. And I think that for that, and today there is, you mentioned the youth, the Kosovo's youth, but what percentage of those are Serbs? What percentage are Roma? Like stated, the, the new Kosovo flag has six stars. And one politician said, well, they can remove two because where the Catholics and the Jews from Kosovo completely disappeared. So I, I just felt slightly offended that this was presented from a purely one-sided story. So thank you. Thank you very much, Hassan. Hi, my name is Andrea Coronado from Rutgers University. Um, Mark pointed out that the experience for young women is completely different from the experience uh, of young men. What steps can be taken to ensure uh, that young girls are being protected in these conflict environments and that they can participate um, actively in the peace process? Thank you. 
Thank you, Andrea. Please, and our final question, and then a very okay. rapid responses from our panelists. Thank you. I'll, I'll try my best to make it very brief. Uh, I'm Rilan Datife. I'm a research intern at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, it's actually quite a, quite a coincidence that my question is related to uh, what the gentleman before me asked. I, I'm from Kosovo, and I grew up there, and uh, I was there during the war. I, my family and I, like so um, almost a million others, had to flee the country, and I was a refugee in Macedonia later on in Finland. Uh, I, I would like to hear the opinion of uh, Professor Summers and especially Mrs. Berry. Uh, during the war, I think we, uh, I, I just wanted to k- comment on her, on the students' protest. Uh, it is very true that the, student, the students' protests were not violent. And uh, since the forceful revocation of the autonomy of Kosovo by Milosevic in 1989, there was pretty much an uh, educational and apartheid institute in Kosovo. Uh, I, I went to school in Kosovo, and me as an Albanian student, I didn't have access to a chemistry lab, to a computer lab. And my Serbian fellow students, they did, and that was basically uh, discrimination based on a nationality from a state agent from top bottom. So my question is, how do you, how do you avoid uh, violence when for so long you have pursued nonviolent means to ad- address issue and get world's attention, but when nobody's listening to you, then unfortunately that might actually, that energy might get channeled through other- otherwise. And uh, just to make a comment, I, this was uh, an asked word, but the gentleman before me said that there are no uh, Serbian students at the University of Pristina. I mean, I have, I have friends there. Uh, I don't know if he's been there, but you can go and uh, see. And there are uh, students of, Bi- of Bosnia, uh, Bosnian origin, of Gorani origin, of Turkish origin. And the most important thing is that uh, a lot of Serbian students ca- are discouraged to study at the University of Pristina because Serbia, Serbia does not recognize those diplomas. So. All right, well, thank you. And Wissam, I think that we could begin with you, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to ask uh, then Joe, Mark, Siobhan, and Stephanie, you have the last word, and we're going to wrap it up within five minutes. So it's really brief, okay? (laughs) Really. (laughs) Excuse me, we're going to finish with our panelists. Thank you very much, and we can take that offline. Um, Wissam, would you begin, and uh, then I'm going to go to Joe. Like and please put the microphone by you so that our webcast audience... Well, I'd like to, uh, to answer the question, what could, uh, steps could be taken to ensure uh, young women to be protected? Actually, during the war, we were integrating the young girls. We were asking the young girls not to stay in the street and the parks living, and they were like, some men are threatening us, some men are looking at us, some men are like harassing us. So we're like, we were integrating them in our work. We told them, you have to take the lead to be with us. And when they were like in a more organized structure, they become stronger and powerful and they can protect themselves. It's, it's not like telling her how to protect herself and uh, giving her information. You should give her some real concrete actions to do in her life so she might find herself in a safe space again. Thank you. Joe, last? Yeah, just to say, apologies for any offense caused, of course. Um, we at the World Bank are currently funding uh, a youth development and inclusion project in Kosovo, and I'd absolutely love to talk to both of you um, to give you more information about that project and uh, um, hear from you whether you think it's hitting the mark and, and going in the right direction. I think I was using the example just um, uh, not as a kind of summary of the overall context, but just to say that I know for myself that the first time often that um, I'm drawn to the uh, Uh, to look at youth issues is when violence is actually broken out. But there is so much going on (laughs) underneath the surface, so much political activism, so much protest, so much um, demonstration, um, as the example of the truck drivers was given, that we we fail to understand because it's peaceful. And actually, if we understood that a bit more and understood uh, what the grievances are and what people are trying to say and and to listen to those protests, we might do better at getting to the point that people think that the only recourse is to violence and that's the only way that they can get their message across. Thank you for that clarification. Mark, 30 right. seconds. Quickly. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, the, uh, the issue that Andrea raised about uh, young girls and protection, um, I, I think the uh, – I think – 
One of the things that happens in just about every post-war situation is that uh, sexual violence just goes through the roof and becomes a really, and domestic violence, I'd point out, uh, uh, and becomes really an epidemic. And I think this severely constrains the options in terms of protection and, and where a young woman can go. So one of the things that I think that uh, people need to think much more carefully about is as opposed to saying, here's a school, if girls want to go, we, they, they should go, is to take into account how dangerous, it is, how dangerous it is to get to school and to get back safely um, and to make education portable as opposed to uh, saying we built the school, so go there. Because it's not going to, that means that a lot of girls can't go. The other issue for education and for jobs training and other things is childcare. A lot of young women at, during and after wars have kids. And something's got to, you know, if you want women, uh, girls to be involved in these programs, you've got to work that out. Um, I'm going to wade very carefully into Kosovo. I, I don't think oh, you are. No, I don't have time. Well, <laughs> I'm going to save you from that journey. Uh, Siobhan. Okay, quickly, um, I think that something that, that this, the questions have, have sparked to me is to point out that we, we haven't really had a, a thorough discussion of ideological um, and, and cultural and identity issues, as well as the class and the lead exclusion things. And I think that those are very important, as well as the multiple identities of young people. Um, in answer to the question about what, what's the purpose of intervention, I think it does, it, it goes on a case-by-case -case basis. But one sort of broad framework uh, seems to me, perhaps, is the need to better document and coordinate what's already going on. I know that in Northern Ireland, for example, um, youth workers will say that a lot of really good projects have been lost. They've just been lost because they weren't documented. They didn't have the time to document them, and now they don't have funding for them anymore. Um, and so an important thing that, that we can do is help to, to create that. And, and, and to, in doing that, educate the, the policy and the political people about the importance of having a youth policy and a youth vision, which I know you're not exactly sure you think that's the case, or should be the case, so maybe we'll have to debate that later. But, so I'll leave it there. And finally, Stephanie, you have the last word. And uh, before you have the last word, I want to thank the audience and all the questions asked. And uh, Stephanie, I'm going to turn it to you to wrap up in your own words. Sure. Well, um, I think this question about what our, what's our purpose, what is the purpose of, really, of intervention, is really summarizes everything. And for me, as you said, it's really on a case-by-case -case basis, and there should be a lot of different purposes um, for different interventions from policy to programs. Um, but for me, um, and I know we've said this over and over, but it's really about finding a way to include youth voices, to give them a platform for their voice. From this voice, as Mark says, we should hope to gather what youth priorities are, what their needs are um, in this context. And I think the missing link that's off, we often get to finding a platform for youth voices and we often get there creatively um, through theater, as Wissam said, through music, through poetry, through journalism. We, we've gotten there and I think the missing link for me is finding, once we've voiced our priorities, someone who listens. And not only someone who listens, but someone who takes that into account, as just Joe said, in a government or political context and makes changes accordingly. And I think that as we look to the future, um, for me, bridging that gap is also important. Um, so, and I would just uh, echo thanks to everyone for coming, and um, I hope you have a chance to enjoy the book. Thank you very much.